Welcome to Jehovah's Witnesses Today. I'm Leonard Credian, producer of this series of video profiles about the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the Jehovah's Witnesses. This series is designed to inform and update you on what is happening within this controversial sect today. Today we have with us Dr. Jerry Bergman, a professor and a former Jehovah's Witness. Jerry is going to share with us his experiences as both a overseer, pioneer within the Jehovah's Witness organization, and also as an individual that worked in various uh, mental health clinics. He's going to share with us some of his experiences that fall into the area of uh, mental illness and emotional distress amongst Jehovah's Witnesses. These are first-hand experiences, of course, that Jerry uh, has um, gained over the years, and he's not only going to tell us about some of the uh, effects that the witness experience has had on individuals, but he's also going to share with us some things, some information that can help us in dealing with these uh, persons that are, have become victims, really, in many respects. Jerry, the first question I wanted to ask you today is, we talk about mental health, and uh, we think what could we say is the basic primary element that we could use to determine a person's mental health? Well, probably the basic definition of mental health is, are you happy and are you able to adjust and deal with the various problems that one encounters in life? Can you deal with the traumas that all of us experience? And mental health, of course, is a major concern in this society today. And it's especially a major concern to me because of my working with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I've discovered that there are many serious mental health problems. And these are quite common. They're not exceptional. In fact, I found about 10% of the average congregation is in serious need of some type of therapy. So we're not talking about a small number. We're talking about a fairly large number. And that means that these people are not at all happy that they're suicidal. They're simply not able to deal with normal day-to-day -day problems that we all encounter. The um, experience that you had, Jerry, is not too unlike uh, many of the experiences that other individuals, I was an elder myself, and, and I do know what you're speaking about uh, with respect to the emotional distress and so forth that um, Jehovah's Witnesses experience. But you did have a, a more, uh, uh, a, a wider, if you will, experience in dealing with uh, this mental illness and emotional uh, distress that uh, we'd like really you to elaborate on a little bit. Could you just tell us a little bit how it was that you ended up uh, getting this uh, unique insight into, this, into the problem, into the situation? Well, one of the major areas of study in, in college was psychology. And in studying psychology, I naturally took an interest in people. And when I became a servant in the congregation that I was affiliated with, I began to deal more and more with the problems that the witnesses had. And I began to realize that the problems that they experienced were, first of all, not small. And secondly, they were far more common than I thought they would be. Most witnesses, I think, believe that Jehovah's Witnesses are pretty well free of emotional problems, that they're very rare, they're very uncommon. And I discovered as time went on that they were anything but uncommon. And later on, I began to work for various mental health clinics. I also taught psychology at the college level. I was an associate professor of psychology at a college. And this exposed me to the problems. I also have done quite a bit of research on the problems of mental illness among the witnesses. And I found that other researchers found the same thing I did, namely that these problems were very serious and very common. And my experience, I think, caused me to try to show concern to try to deal with this problem. And I dealt with it at first by trying to help individual witnesses who I perceive needed help. And of course, my work with the clinic, they came to me and they sought out help. So in my employment at the clinic, then I was assigned to deal with those Jehovah's Witnesses that came to the clinic. Also in my work in the congregation, I was in essence assigned to try to help those individuals who experienced these problems because the other servants in the congregation realized I had this background 
and so they naturally assigned me or had asked me to intervene in the cases where they felt they couldn't adequately deal with. Jerry, uh, we realize that you had these experiences, of course, and obviously had considerable empathy for the Jehovah's Witnesses that were in your congregation as you worked with them. How was it, though, that you got involved with them in the sort of mental health clinic uh, level? Can you tell us about that, please? Well, I was employed for these various mental health clinics, uh, both in a research capacity and both as a therapist. And so my, my job, my livelihood, was essentially doing therapy. And in this role, I was able to work with many witnesses. And, of course, I had a special interest in working with witnesses. And the director of the clinic knew this, and he assigned to me clients that had a witness background. We had an intake system where they were evaluated, and then after the evaluation occurred, we then assigned them to the therapist that we felt they were best uh, suited to work with. And thus, in my employment role, I worked in this capacity. Within the framework, uh, Jerry, of course, of the congregation, and then later on, and um, coinciding with that, when you were doing your work in the mental health clinic, what would you find, if we could, if we could sort of do an overall framework, what did you find was your overall findings? In other words, what were the elements of distress and so on? What were these things that seemed to keep emerging as uh, the, 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 the standard amongst them? Well, probably the most common problem that I encountered was essentially many witnesses I worked with were very depressed. They had no goal or purpose in life. They were very devoted witnesses, but yet saw the new world as being somewhat illusionary. And they, in many cases, deferred what most normal people want to do. For example, going to college, a career, developing their artistic talents, developing other interests that they had. And witnesses seemed to live a life forever on hold. And they can do that for a while, but after four, five, six, ten, twenty years, it gets rather difficult to live your life on hold. And many felt guilty about their depression. They felt guilty about the problems that they were experiencing. Many felt, as a witness, I shouldn't experience these problems, but yet they were. And aside from this, I think a lot had a great deal of guilt about desires they had. I had one client that told me that she was very guilty because she liked to listen to classical music and she felt this was wrong because she realized that much of this music was composed for the church for use in the church and so her liking of Beethoven, Bach and so on, she felt guilty about this. So witnesses I find have a tremendous amount to feel guilty about and so depression, guilt, self-doubt and also I think many of them have serious doubts about the validity of the Watchtower Society. Many of them strongly believe the Watchtower Society is God's organization but many have questions and doubts, and these doubts, I think, cause them a lot of problems. They nag at them, so to speak. And because of their doubts about the Watchtower Society, I think they question whether they're wasting their life. And this can be a scary thought if you're devoting your whole life to an organization like the Watchtower. Just the fleeting thought that maybe I'm wasting my life doing something that is foolish, or maybe I'm giving my life to an organization that's wrong, this can be very scary, and these doubts, I think, nag at them over and over until finally they break out, so to speak, in serious emotional problems, guilt, depression. I had a lot of obsessive-compulsive people I worked with, which I think stems from the guilt trip that the Watchtower organization puts on people. As an elder jury, I recall myself uh, over the years, many times uh, handling some, some pretty uh, odd cases and so forth, but you know, it always seemed that the advice that the society gave us was that uh, the problem wasn't within the person so much in terms of uh, uh, these external things we're, we're, we're speaking about, but it was probably a spiritual problem, that they weren't uh, studying enough, that they needed to study more. And the study usually revolved around some society publication and not really uh, the Bible, as it were. Uh, I have caught, however, in recent uh, Watchtower publications a, a slightly different tone. I, I'm starting to read articles that indicate to me that the society is beginning to face and understand that yes indeed there are emotional problems amongst Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you found this to be the case in, in your readings and, and, and uh, you really in, in certain respects were a pioneer in all of this. Uh, did you ever bring this to the uh, attention of say the Watchtower officials and so on? What was their reaction to, to, uh, to this information? 
Yes, I've noticed this uh, very same thing myself. It seemed at first when I began to work with witnesses in this capacity that the society would fight against what was necessary to help them. They would seem to counteract the therapy that was needed in order to help these people adjust and become mentally healthy. And I often noted that this was occurring and talked to a number of governing body officials like Brother Schroeder and uh, several others about this. And I'm not sure that they listened carefully to what I said, but I think what I had to say did have an impact upon them. And probably, too, what happened was they received reports throughout the world of suicides, of, of uh, severe emotional problems our witnesses were having. And I think it became very apparent to them that there were many very serious, emotionally ill people in the organization. And we're not just talking about persons at the lower level. We're talking about circuit overseers, and I understand several members of the governing body had serious emotional problems. So I think after a while, they, they could no longer deny it. They realized that these problems were there, and they had to deal with them. And also in my writing, I've written several journal articles. I've written a book on this topic. I've also written a number of other papers, and I usually sent copies of these to individuals at the Watchtower Society. And although they never directly stated to me that these influenced them, I had a hard time feeling that they didn't. And I'm sure there are others who are sending similar reports to the Society. There is an individual who likewise was a witness out in a, another state that I lived in, and he, I understand, wrote a paper on the very same topic I did, on the mental health problems. And he sent a copy to the society and personally talked to a number of individuals there as well. And I think from so many angles, this information saying the same thing was coming forth, that they realized they had to deal with it. And I think now they are trying to, in some way at least, deal with these problems. They can no longer ignore them because they are so serious and so widespread. And so they are making some efforts to deal with them. But I think the basic problems are still there. They still send witnesses on a guilt trip. They still ask you to put your life on hold. They still ask you to live in what, in many ways, is a very abnormal world. And if you look at the witness world very carefully, one wonders why people would not go insane living in this world, or at least not have emotional problems. It's a very abnormal world. And so they are acknowledging these things, but in a very small way, I believe. I believe what they are doing is a drop in the bucket. It's a, a penny in the sea of, of dollars that needs to be looked at. So what they will do in the future is hard to say. They still tend to believe if you pray more, study more, go out in service, all your problems will disappear. This still tends to be the major teaching. Although they do recognize, well, in some cases, maybe antidepressants would be appropriate in some cases, maybe a vacation would be appropriate, and maybe it's not wrong now, they're saying, to go to a two-year technical college. That was condemned, college was, for years. Now they're saying, well, maybe a two-year technical college would not be that bad. It's still wrong to go to a college, and of course wrong to go to a university, but maybe a couple years of schooling is okay. So there is some flexibility now, which there was not before. But ironically, in other areas, there's more rigidity. So they seem to deal effectively in some areas, then in other areas, they take two or three steps backward and seem to contribute more to the problems they have. Joe, sure, you know, it's interesting as we sit here and talk about these things, and uh, I've read a variety of papers, and I know that you have access to far more things than I probably read. In corroboration of the things we're talking about, uh, what have other researchers actually developed? What have they come up with? Uh, anything uh, different, or is it just uh, a total corroboration of what we're, what we're speaking about here today? Well, I've reviewed uh, quite a bit of research on the witnesses, and in this area especially, and I found all the studies that I consulted found exactly the same thing, and that is namely the mental illness rate is about four times higher than you'd find in the population as a whole. So this is a pretty serious problem, which is universally recognized by all researchers in the field. So my research is not uh, different than the other uh, studies that I've looked at. And this is also true not only in this country, but also in other countries. And some of the studies were done 30 and 40 years ago. So we're talking about a very consistent, 
high level of mental illness in all times in this century and all places. Would you say, Jerry, there's, there's uh, uh, following the same theme, this, this idea of the other researchers and your own findings and so on, is there a, a statistical uh, percentage that we could we could utilize here? Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a third as high, or it's a quarter as high, or it's higher or less, wh whatever. Is there a percentage that can be applied in, in this case? Well, it depends on what specific type of mental illness you're looking at. When you look specifically at schizophrenia, the studies consistently are about four or five, six times higher than the non-witness population. In other words, among witnesses, schizophrenia is about four or five times higher than among non-witnesses. If you look at depression, it's probably six, eight, ten times higher. It also depends specifically on the cutoff point. If you're very liberal in defining depression, you could define it as five times, ten times higher. If you're very strict, the definition would be different. We're clearly talking about a rate though that's far higher. Whether it's exactly four times or five times is kind of irrelevant. It's clearly higher. And that's the major concern we need to look at. The society uh, practices, of course, shunning. And um, for many, many years, of course, this applied to the person who had been removed from the congregation, disfellowshipped, uh, which is equivalent, of course, to excommunication. And uh, this has obviously had an effect on those individuals. At the same time, we, we think now since 1981, September 15th, 1981, the Watchtower developed that those persons who would um, willingly um, leave the society would be put in the same category. So that today we have thousands upon thousands of persons who are being shunned by their former friends, by their relatives, by their parents, by everyone. Now this must have some incredible effect on the individual, Jerry. What would you say the, the major impact of that would be? That's a very good question that you posed. I think it's one that is especially of concern today in the Watchtower Society. The press often uses the term shunning, but I think it's much more than that among the witnesses. Some religions, it's true, do practice shunning, but it's more of a social estrangement, more of a social uh, setting the person apart. The witnesses, it's a total cutting off, which is really quite a bit different. The witnesses consider someone who's disfellowshipped which is the term they use, as literally, in more ways than one, dead. And even one's own parents are not allowed to speak to one unless they say it's absolutely necessary, which really is very few conditions. So it's really a total, absolute cutting off of all persons who are witnesses in good standing. And I think to illustrate the effect of disfellowshipping on a person, I think it's best that I probably read a, a case which I worked with which to me illustrates what commonly happens. And this is the case of a young man who was a very enthusiastic witness. He was involved in the organizations for four or five years, and he was a very good, astute witness. He read a great deal of the Watchtower publications. In fact, I noticed that he was answering more questions at the meetings than those who were witnesses for 20, 30 years. And he would develop questions as time went on and he asked these to the elders and the elders tried to answer them politely at first but at time I th in time I think the questions became more and more difficult and it was harder and harder for the elders to answer these questions and after a while they saw him as a troublemaker they saw these questions not as sincere questions which they were but they saw him as trying to stir up trouble trying to cause dissension in the organization and after a while then, they told him he should not be asking these questions. He should simply accept what the society says and not uh, create dissension by asking these questions. So then he started to write to the society in endeavoring to try to find answers to these questions. And in time, the society became more and more stringent with him and said, look, do not ask these questions. Accept what we tell you, and read the Watchtower, do not think beyond that. They accused him of what they call running ahead of God's organization. And in time, they finally put him on probation and disfellowshipped him because he felt if he was going to be involved in an organization, he needed to know for sure. He needed to know in his own mind completely whether or not there were answers to these questions and whether or not his concerns were indeed valid. And so when he was disfellowshipped, his whole family was no longer able to talk to him. His mother, his brothers, his sisters, 
all of his relatives were totally cut off. And being cut off completely from all of these people was so traumatic for him that he finally committed suicide in front of the Kingdom Hall. He literally blew his head off with a shotgun, which caused quite a stir in the community. But here was a young man who I knew fairly well. He was torn between twine, trying to find answers to his sincere questions and trying to please his folks, but yet he couldn't deny his intellect. He couldn't deny these concerns. They were there. And he told me once, I can't just tell myself, forget about them. They are there, and, and I have these questions, and I think about them. And I just can't flush them out of my system as they want me to. I need answers. I want answers. I feel I should be able to go to the elders for answers, and that they couldn't provide answers was very tormenting for him. So he was torn between his intellectual doubt, his questioning, and between what happened later, which was total cutting off of him from his family, including his wife and his children, who were also witnesses at that time. So to me, this is a very tragic story, but yet in many ways is very typical of why people are disfellowshipped. By the way, the most common reason people are disfellowshipped is for sexual reasons, but the second most common is for questioning different aspects of the Watchtower society, and these are often sincere questions that these people propound. So for questioning, for sincere questioning, many of these people's lives are ruined. I'm reminded, Jerry, of the Judicial Committee system uh, as an elder, and you were an overseer um, as well, so you were quite familiar with the system of Judicial Committee, whereby if a person in the congregation uh, came into some uh, error or they had done something wrong, whatever the case may be, uh, if it was of serious enough uh, import, we would haul them in, three of us, three elders, and um, have a hearing with them, which could lead to anything from a severe um, disfellowshipping, removing from the congregation, or to a probation, uh, to a series of things, a lecturing even, but usually it had uh, fairly heavy import. Now, surely this must have, I've, I've seen cases, as I've, I've sat on many of those, where people would, would break down in front of us as they discussed the things that they were guilty of and so on. And I could tell that they came in just totally unnerved to sit before us. That used to cut me to the heart a little bit, I must confess, because I thought, we're their shepherds, and yet they seem to have an incredible fear of us as they come in to see us. Uh, this must have a, 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 an effect on an individual. This must, must have something to do with the emotional distress that some could feel, uh, even uh, some sort of a fear syndrome that could, could seize an individual. What, what, what did you find on that? What, what's been your experience in that area? I agree very much. I've had a lot of experience in working with judicial committees on both sides, in my case, and it's extremely traumatic for many people because your future, and many people believe your life literally hangs on the decision of those in the committee. And it's really not a very just situation because here you are in a closed room, you by yourself, in essence three opposers, three people who are trying to hear the case, and it's very difficult, I think, for justice to be served in that situation. And if they're out to get you, which in many cases they are, no matter what happens, you've lost. And on the other hand, if they're out to condone what you're doing, which in some cases they are, you've won no matter what you say. So I think a lot depends upon the people hearing the case. And I've worked with many cases which I thought were very traumatic in their extent and what happened. One person, he found it so traumatic that he committed suicide shortly before the judicial hearing because he realized what hung on the balance there. And I guess he just didn't want to face it. He couldn't face it. And so he did commit suicide. And one case I worked with, too, that there were a number of people accused of doing something wrong. And we brought the first one in, and this person was found guilty and put on probation. And then the first person said, well, I've been caught, I've been exposed, let's bring in Brother Jones and Brother Taylor and Sister Smith because they were all doing the same thing. It was not a major thing actually they were doing. But, and then the other, one of the other witnesses said, well, we don't want to make this a witch hunt. We'll just prosecute you and we'll stop there. And this made him very angry because he felt, I did it fine. I'm taking my punishment. Let's punish all the rest for doing the same thing. And they didn't want to do that. 
they stopped with him. And he later on left the organization, not because he was put on probation, but because he felt it was so manifestly unfair that they caught him and he got convicted, but everybody else got away with what they were doing. And it was so minor, I really don't even remember now what he was found guilty of. But I thought the injustice which was illustrated there is a major problem in these hearings. And also you have no real way of appealing what's going on. And this is traumatic. If you don't get a fair shake the first time, basically you're finished because there really is no effective just appeal system that it's totally up to those elders in that room what happens to your fate. Yes, you're right, Jerry. Um, I'm reminded of the so-called appeal committees and so forth. And they were in place. There was a, it was a, ostensibly a, an arrangement that a person could appeal their case, but usually uh, the deck was loaded. Uh, basically, it became nothing more than a kangaroo court. Essentially, if a, a person was disfellowshipped by one group of elders, it had to be some sort of a horrendous case of uh, some nature that would bring in people from the outside and circuit overseers and one thing or another, uh, that it had been such an obvious mistake, would the appeal be, you know, uh, the, the actual case be uh, dismissed or rescinded. Generally, the appeal was nothing more than an exercise. Yeah, you're right. This raises the whole question of justice, and I found that oftentimes when people uh, face the judicial committee and when they realize that there doesn't seem to be much justice in the Watchtower Society, that many leave because of this lack of justice. And this, of course, has been a major concern among dissonant witnesses in the past few years, the lack of justice. Many witnesses feel powerless in the Watchtower Society. They feel like a prisoner, that their whole life is ordered and scheduled that they really have little control over their own life. And this feeling of powerlessness is a very common uh, precedent, we could say, or antecedent to individuals who develop depression and emotional problems. This is why we pe uh, put people in prison, because prison puts them in a powerless situation, and this is punishment. Likewise, we find many people in the Watchtower Society see themselves as powerless in an unjust situation. And this typically causes, in many witnesses at least, severe problems. Jerry, you know, we've been talking an awful lot about um, the way this whole thing has affected individuals. But I think a thing that has to be, or an area that has to be examined somewhat, is the family. I remember very clearly as an elder, a uh, number, numerous cases of uh, real dissension in families. Uh, children uh, becoming very rebellious, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, wives and husbands uh, interchanges that, that seem to be very, very negative and that come to us uh, with some of these problems and so on. And I remember many, many cases of, of uh, children, uh, as soon as they became in their late teens, just leaving, just leaving the organization and leaving their family, running away, in fact. And uh, this is obviously indicative of, of uh, incredible stress within the family unit. Jehovah's Witnesses like to um, speak about the... Um, uh, happy families. Many of the articles uh, seem to uh, have headings, the hap God's happy family and happy, happy family units within the larger family, as it were, and so forth. And uh, I don't think the, the, the facts really prove this. I think that we find an awful lot of uh, uh, cases of uh, family breakdown, as a matter of fact, from these pressures of meetings and so forth. And your examination in, in the cases that you handle possibly in a clinical way, as well as, uh, of course, as an overseer, uh, did you find this to be the case, or, or what, what exactly uh, seemed to be the situation? Yes, I agree very much so. It's my experience as well, both of those, with those people I've worked with, as well as my own personal experience, that the Watchtower Society is, as some people say, hard on families. It's very difficult for a family to stay together. This is, there are many reasons for this. In my own situation, I remember very well going to five meetings a week, which is five hours, commuting time, preparation time, going out in service. In my case, as a, a servant in the congregation, I had to spend a great deal of time in committee meetings and so on. I found that I was literally spending 30, 40, and sometimes 50 hours a week, plus working 40 hours a week. So it simply absorbed almost all of my time. So aside from working and going to meetings and so on, there was literally hardly any time left for the family. 
And so the time factor alone causes problems. I remember rushing to, to get dinner ready and to eat dinner, and we never washed dishes, dishes after dinner. We had to go to a meeting, and by the time we got back, it was often 10, 10.30, and then we didn't feel like cleaning up the kitchen and so on. So the kitchen was a mess until the morning, and then we had to get breakfast, and I had to go off to work, so I left all of that for my wife to do, which was very difficult, very hard on us. And of course, the major impediment, I think, in keeping families together is what often happens is when people become witnesses, both quite often do not become witnesses and in the family. And therefore, you have what they call a divided household. Typically, the wife was a witness and the husband was not. So this caused perpetual conflict, as one would imagine, within the family. Also, what commonly happens is when one begins to have doubts, the other doesn't. So one leaves the society or leaves the organization, the other doesn't. So this not uncommonly causes a divorce. Also, we find that within the society there is a great deal of, for many reasons, immorality going on. And this also serves to divide the family. One is put in many tempting situations within the congregation. So there are many, many reasons why the family is not the solid family the society likes to picture it as. It's interesting, Jerry, I've noticed in the um, articles recently in the uh, society's publications that there's a considerable emphasis on uh, the youth. It seems that they're uh, drawing their attention to the problems amongst the youth, uh, rebelliousness, uh, this, that, or the other thing, uh, certainly warning them against many of the hazards of modern life, uh, uh, drug abuse and so forth, which is very practical advice, obviously. But it indicates to me that there's a considerable uh, degree of problems amongst the youth. Now, that existed when I was serving as an elder. That was the case back then. And I'm sure that uh, some of the things that are maybe taking place today, uh, pressures in school or whatever, seems to be exacerbating this problem because they are definitely turning their attention to this. Now, I remember even my own daughter, uh, she uh, led a very lonely uh, life as a child, really. Um, we discouraged her from having uh, friends apart from those that she had in the local congregation that were also Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, she spent every day in the hall uh, so that she wouldn't have to uh, uh, stand for the national anthem or flag salute. Um, there was all the little uh, activities that were normal to the school child that she could not engage in. She could not engage in birthday parties or any uh, uh, Thanksgiving activity or whatever. It was all a no-no and, and a no-no. And I, I think that it had an effect upon her. I think that she, she was a very, very quiet, uh, withdrawn, and, and lonely child. Fortunately, she's turned out to be a, a fairly normal, well-balanced individual as an adult. I'm not so sure, though, that this is the case with all children. Um, even in my experience, I saw some that were, were really, really suffering from some real uh, withdrawal, real emotional problems. And uh, I suppose with your background and your interest in this whole area, uh, you have observed this and possibly even more. Yeah, I agree very much with what you brought out. I think it's very difficult to grow up a normal child as a witness because there are so many things that you cannot do that everyone else around you does. And you are severely isolated from friends, from developing normally, socially. In my own case, the school that I went to, there was no witnesses. So I was not allowed to associate with anyone. I had to grow up by myself, so to speak. And I did not have any people that lived nearby that were young, about my age, and were witnesses. So as a result, I had to turn to other means to satisfy social needs, which is not easy. It's not easy for a witness to, to grow up in this environment. The thing that bothers me, I think, is the society does seem to be oblivious to this. They seem to feel, well, it doesn't matter. Just do the best you can, and I'm getting will be here any day, so it doesn't really matter. But it is true, I think they realize more and more it does matter because young witnesses have many severe problems. And I think they realize now they have to respond to these in some way. So that's why they do have more and more articles about the problems of young people and how to deal with these. But no matter how hard they try, I think, as long as you have a situation where you see everyone else as evil, where you cannot partake in so many activities, in, in sports, in extracurricular activities, in student government activities, in almost all school activities except the minimum required activities, when these are all off limits, I find it hard to understand how anyone could grow up a normal child under these circumstances. Of course, many do later adjust. Many do overcome these problems they had as a youth. 
but it takes a lot of time and a lot of work, I think, to overcome the stigma that one has growing up a witness child. And it is a reason why many people who were raised witnesses have so many problems later on as adults. And I worked for the court for a number of years, and many of the individuals I worked with were raised witnesses. And it intrigued me how someone raised a witness could end up a murderer, a rapist, involved in some heinous crime. But I found many were raised witnesses and involved themselves in these crimes because they were so socially maladjusted that when they became adults, they were not adequately able to cope with adult responsibilities and adult life. And thus, because of maladjustment, ended up involving themselves in these crimes that they did, that I saw them involve themselves in. You know, Jerry, with respect to the judicial committees and the type of things we used to have to handle, some of them were a little more innocuous than others, uh, cigarette smoking while it is a dirty habit, of course. I'm not totally convinced it's a salvation issue. There were many other things, of course, drug uh, abuse and uh, cases, many cases of immorality, things like that. But um, I remember a case in particular that, that stood out in my mind as being uh, pretty unusual in certain respects because of the, the fact that this is, you know, uh, this supposedly uh, fine Christian organization and what the footage would be of that. It was three young men in their 20s, actually, probably late 20s, and uh, they were from our area here, and they went out to uh, Palm Springs with uh, uh, revolvers, actually, and got involved in armed robbery. They stuck up a camera store, which was an obvious um, uh, judicial committee uh, arrangement, and uh, it did result in a disfellowship. And the three young men were disfellowshipped, of course, for that. It was a very clear-cut case, and uh, there was prison terms involved and so forth. Uh, did you, in your uh, wider scope of, of uh, examination of matters like this, did you, did you find or have you found that this, this type of thing uh, would prevail in, in an organization like that? Yes, I did find the same thing pretty much. Uh, I worked for the court, as I had mentioned, for a number of years. And in my experience there, I found I was shocked, actually, to discover that there were many individuals who were raised witnesses who were deeply involved in crime. And I explored to some degree why this is true. And I found when the witnesses discourage higher education, when they discourage career advancement, when they discourage an individual from developing him or herself, I found the result of this was people were forced to stay at the bottom rungs of society. Many witnesses were lower class, or at least lower middle class. And as a result, they associated with an element which was heavily involved in crime. So I found many witnesses were dragged into crime or involved themselves in crime for various reasons. And I was uh, quite surprised to find that there's even a number of cases that I worked with that involved brutal murders. We had one case where a young boy had robbed by gunpoint a paper boy, and the paper boy resisted, so he shot and killed the paper boy. There was another young witness who his family were very involved in the witness work, and he was involved in quite a number of rapes in the community. And finally, he got a natural life sentence because he was seen as such a threat to the community that they felt it would be best that he put away in the prison for as long as he lived. And while working with these individuals, I had a chance to talk to many of them to try to find out why they involved themselves in these heinous crimes. And I found many of them were involved in such things because they were so frustrated and so angry at the organization they were a part of that they lashed out against sometimes those they loved, sometimes against strangers. So there's a reason I discovered these people did the things they did. Now sometimes it was because of their environment, but I think the witness religion tends to force people to stay in a lower class environment. It forces them to stay in poverty, in a poverty situation, or at least a lower middle class situation. And this tends to involve them or facilitate their involvement in criminal activities. I think this is something we need to look more carefully at in organizations such as the Witnesses because some organizations encourage education. The Witnesses, in discouraging education, produce a lot of negative ramifications. 
such as the high level of crime, and I did my PhD thesis on crime, by the way, and one aspect I studied was religion and crime. And I found that in most cases, religion had a positive influence on criminal behavior. There was only a few cases, one of which was the witnesses, where religion had a negative influence on criminal behavior, at least with the population that I worked with. The sad indictment, Jerry, I think on the society is the fact that uh, they don't encourage and in fact they discourage professional help for the membership. I think that perhaps if that had been uh, utilized down through the years, perhaps many of the things we're talking about wouldn't be uh, as extreme as they've become. But in fact, uh, in my experience, and I'm presuming in your experience, uh, which is far wider in that area, that's the case. They just discourage uh, professional help. Yes, they do very much discourage uh, a witness who has emotional problems seeking professional help, and I think this is a tragedy. I've seen so many cases where a witness needed some type of professional help and did not get this help, and therein lied the tragedy. One case in particular I worked fairly closely with was a witness who was uh, very active in the congregation for many, many years, and he started to behave very strangely. And they thought that possibly the furniture in his house was demonized because he had bought it from the Salvation Army. And so they decided to begin to burn his furniture to destroy the demon influence. So they burned one piece after another, and they had burned almost every piece of furniture in his house when he was still getting worse. So they thought, well, maybe it was his clothes. So they started to burn his clothes. And then they started to burn other things in the house, his family portraits and so on. And finally they realized this was not working. And so finally, partially because of my encouragement, they took him to a medical doctor for an examination. And the medical doctor right away recognized that what was wrong was probably a brain tumor and encouraged him to be taken to a hospital. They finally found out indeed it was a brain tumor and he needed surgery. But because he refused blood, they had to find a surgeon that would operate on him without the need of blood. And they found it hard to, to find one. They finally located a surgeon who was willing to try in another city. And on the way to the hospital, the man died. And to me, this is a good example of what happens over and over again. Witnesses are discouraged from seeking professional help. Now, it's true they're generally not discouraged from seeking help from a medical doctor. But in the past, they were. In the past, medical doctors were criticized or frowned upon. And less and less, that became true. Now, it's psychologists, psychiatrists, and generally mental health professions that witnesses are taught to stay away from. And this still causes problems, although the society doesn't have a, a blanket prohibition. But if you read the literature, it's quite clear that going to a mental health professional is seen as basically wrong or at least immature. And the witness ethos, the witness feeling, is very, very negative towards mental health uh, professions. And as a result, many of them do not get the type of help that they need. And even medication, in many cases, in the past at least, has been frowned upon. Yes, it's interesting, uh, Jerry, as you uh, say this, when we consider the statistics over the past uh, 10 years, uh, it's common knowledge that uh, approximately 1 million persons have left the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now, this is no small number. What we're talking about there is basically and essentially a third of the total membership that they have today, that is uh, active Jehovah's Witnesses, around three million persons. So we have sort of a revolving door situation going on there. Now, people are leaving because of a whole variety of reasons. Of the million, of course, some have been disfellowshipped for a whole variety of reasons. But many, many, many are dissidents, individuals who recognize that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is not all that it claims. It, they've examined very closely this whole appointment business uh, in 1918, 1919, and they see that that is an absolute sham and a joke. And we haven't got time to go into that here, of course, but uh, the so-called appointment of them as God's organization, his, his uh, uh, specific group of people uh, here in this time period that we're in, the doctrinal changes, the uh, false prophecies, 100 years of false prophecies, having suffered three major gate failures and a whole bunch of minor gate failures, we see that, um, that uh, this is growing in actual fact. And as I think about that, it, call, it calls to mind 
an area that really does concern me. Number one, we know that the Jehovah's Witness, the act of Jehovah's Witness, the person that's in the congregations, fine people, many of them, many of them, just absolutely fine persons, deluded, yes, but fine individuals that are suffering these conditions we're talking about. Uh, I think of those persons, but I think also about that million, because although our files are full, Marjorie and I, our files are full of letters from individuals that have left, they're in a burned out state, they're almost anti-religious, they want nothing to do with religion, they, uh, many of them, these letters that make you cry, are suffering severe mental depression and emotional distress. That's the question now that comes to my mind. Uh, it's easy for us to sit here in the comfort of this home and discuss these things, uh, the problems, uh, some of the causes, we certainly haven't gone into all of the causes and some of the problems that uh, witnesses have. But what do we do, what do we do as persons who are concerned about, who are interested in Jehovah's Witnesses? We're not looking at them in some clinical overview, uh, disinterested with them, in them as persons, but looking at them in some sociological overview. We are interested in those persons as individuals. What can we do as, yes, individuals, what can we do to share with persons who want to help these people? Uh, I know your book, for example, uh, which we have not really had opportunity to discuss at length here, goes into cases that, that exceed by, by a number of uh, uh, readings, if you want to call it what we've talked about here today, but it also goes into some very fine areas of helping these persons. What can we do to help these persons? And I think we should really try to address that for a moment or two before we conclude this uh, this afternoon's uh, interview. The question of what we can do to help those who leave is, of course, a very important question, especially since so many do leave, and many do have problems, but of course, many do eventually adjust to leaving, and it's very difficult at first. I think, first of all, we need to understand how difficult it is to leave the Watchtower Society. It's not a ordinary religion, so to speak. It's a religion that encompasses your whole being. Your friends are typically witnesses. You're strongly discouraged from associating with any non-witness. Your whole life revolves around the witnesses. Your whole life revolves around the eminence of Armageddon. It's your whole being. And so when you leave the witnesses, basically your whole support system is taken away. Your, your whole reason for living in many ways is taken away your whole modus operandi is taken away. So it is extremely traumatic because you're losing so much. You're losing your belief structure, your friends, many times your business, your career, etc. So we have to realize, first of all, it is extremely traumatic. And to help a person adjust to leaving, I think the most important thing we can do is try to replace as much as they've lost. For example, you lose your friends. So to deal with that, you need new friends which is not easy because for a long time you feel the only people you should associate with are witnesses and you look down immensely on non-witnesses. You feel witnesses are good people, non-witnesses are all bad people. And therefore it's hard to develop new friends among non-witnesses. But in time, most people do. In many large cities, there are witness support groups. So when you leave, these people will help you find new friends. They will help you reestablish your place in society. They will help you readjust your thinking so you no longer hate the things that witnesses are taught to hate, such as all other religions. They help you see that there are some people who go to other churches who are not evil people, as the witnesses strongly imply. So it's a very slow process, and it's a very difficult process. But most people that I have talked to five or ten years later, after they have left the witnesses, state they didn't know why they didn't leave sooner. They should have left five years ago. If I would have known what i would known today, there's no way I would have stayed as long as I, I did. Many look upon it as wasted ten or twenty years. Many people feel, well, it's a stage of my life. I, I spent twenty years in the witnesses and I regret it, but this is what I did and I can't take back those years now. So therefore, all I can do is make the best of where I am now. So it's not easy, but it can be done. But it's interesting that extremely few, peop few people, once they leave, extremely few go back to the society, which I think says something. As a matter of fact, those who have left for more than five years, it's almost one out of a thousand that return. So it's extremely few. And of those that return, 
many of them again leave. Which says, I think, that in the long run, once they've readjusted, they have no desire to return. Yes, Jerry, in, in deference, you know, to the thousands upon thousands of uh, individuals that leave the Watchtower Bottom Track Society, and come out, they were very, very balanced individuals in there, and they came out as balanced individuals. Nevertheless, some of them theologically a little mixed up, of course, and, and so forth. Uh, I have an expression that uh, you can take persons out of the watchtower, but sometimes it's uh, rather difficult to take the watchtower out of persons. I'm amazed uh, how many individuals will carry this uh, watchtower cobwebs almost in their mind for many, many, many years. Uh, some of them even suffering from um, a measure of guilt that maybe, maybe that, you know, they they overstep themselves, perhaps they, they really have left God's organization, questions and so on, but gradually, and I think that's where Christians have to be extremely patient with the individual that leaves the Watchtower Bible and Track Society. I think we all walk our road to Damascus at uh, various speeds. I think some run to Damascus, some stride, and some crawl on their hands and knees. And I think we have to give them an awful lot of love and empathy and, and encourage them to, to look at biblical Christianity uh, study the scriptures and, and understand that uh, their salvation is by grace and that they might abandon any of these hang-ups they might have on a, on a works orientation and uh, legalism and so on and some of these things that will, will stay in their character almost from the years and years and years of indoctrination. I think the more we can do to encourage them to relax and, and enjoy the scriptures and read the scriptures and study the commentaries and so forth and come to a, a relaxed understanding of the love, actually, that uh, God has for mankind uh, is manifested through His Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, that direction, too, that encouragement, without being oppressive uh, to them, but rather leading them gently and lovingly to uh, examine these things and reevaluate some of the things that they, they might still be carrying with them from the past and uh, look at it with a fresh, uh, clean outlook. And I think this, because I've seen it happen, I see some marvelously well put together Christian individuals, uh, healthy, mentally healthy, and uh, the family in order and so forth. Individuals that left the Watchtower, Bible and Tract Society, you would never guess that they'd even ever had that experience. Yeah, that's true. I've seen many too, likewise, who have adjusted quite well, I think, to leaving. And uh, But it's difficult, and I guess my professional background and my orientation has not been spending a great deal of time with those who are well adjusted by spending a great deal of time with those who are not well adjusted. So I guess my experience is, is more with those who are having problems. And so thus I'm far more aware of the concerns here. And this, I guess, is true with many of us. And as you mentioned, I think it's a good point. We do have to be very patient because some of these people, it takes years and years to get the watchtower out of them, so to speak. Many people who were witnesses 20 years ago still adhere to many of the Watchtower ideas because I think it's like cleaning out a house. You generally don't take everything out and burn it and replace it. You destroy those that you see need replacing. You, you get rid of a piece of furniture that's broken, that you see it's broken, and you replace it. So like, likewise with Watchtower ideas, you get rid of those you see a need to replace. And if you don't see a need to replace it, it sits there. And so I think in helping those who were witnesses, we need to help them understand or help them see what needs to be replaced, which is not always easy because, of course, many of the West Tower ideas are certainly very good. Their emphasis on clean living, their emphasis on uh, importance to the family. They, of course, don't always live up to this, but they do emphasize these things. So there is a lot of positive things that the West Tower emphasizes. If it was all negative, it wouldn't attract anyone. I think the reason the Watchtower has grown so much is because there is a lot of positive there. It's like the honey with the poison in it. People generally don't eat poison by itself. You've got to put poison in something good. And I think the same thing is true with the Watchtower Society. And so cleaning out this stuff is not easy. It's very difficult. It's very hard to separate the arsenic from the honey. And that's why people stay so long, I think. People stay years after they see clearly that there are things wrong. After one prophetic date failed after another, I talked with a man who was a witness for about 80 years. And I said, now you've lived through six or seven prophetic dates that failed. You saw 1925. You, you knew that they predicted, oh yes, they clearly predicted 
25, 1925. That's when Armageddon would be here. Very, very clear. And yet you stayed. He stayed until after 1975, and then he left. So I asked him, why? Why did you stay for so long after you saw so clearly that what they taught was wrong? He said, well, there was so much to hold me. He said, there was so much good that I couldn't leave. The bad had to become so great before I left, and it did. 1975 was, for him, the last straw, so to speak. But when he did finally leave, I believe he was in his 80s. So it took a lot for him to leave. And for many of us, it takes an awful lot because there is so much holding power that the Wastile Society has. And this is what outsiders don't see. They see only the bad. They don't tend to see the tremendous holding power that the society has upon us. Well, it's clear to me, Jerry, that uh, the experiences that I had and that you had also uh, as elders and the uh, cases that we were involved with on the congregation or at the congregation level is far, far greater and far wider than the average Jehovah's Witness uh, would begin to imagine. I agree very much so, and I think it's hard for us to sit here really and, and even begin to relate the tragedy and the suffering of so many, many, many people that were involved in what you might call the snare of the watchtower. And I just, the past few minutes, have been thinking about the many, many cases I've worked with in the past 10 years. and the incredible, untold human suffering of so many, many people whose lives were just simply ruined or at least damaged so much for so long of a period. And it's, I think, the Jehovah's Witnesses are one of the tragedies of this 20th century. And there are just so many problems that they have produced and have wrought, which have carried us right into the, the, the time period of today. And there needs to be, I think, more awareness of what's going on, more awareness of, of what they have done to so many people. We're aware of Jonestown very well, but I don't think many people are aware of, of the untold tragedy that the witnesses have produced in our time period today. And people need to be aware of this so they can respond to it, and hopefully our discussion here will help a few people become more aware of this uh, heinous, clearly heinous, situation. On that note, it's incumbent upon all of us, those of us that might come into contact with Jehovah's Witnesses, those persons who are in the Watchtower Society in good standing, those individuals that have left the organization, it really is our responsibility to look at them in love and empathy, reach out to them in compassion, because these persons have experienced some very, very unusual circumstances in their lives. They've come out of a hermetically sealed society. They are part of a, an organization that is oppressive, that is very demanding. Legalistic, yes, and works oriented. All of the things we've discussed today can result in the breakdown of many individuals. Nervous breakdown, mental illness, emotional distress, these things we've talked about. So I think as Christian persons, we should find it within our hearts to look upon these persons really as victims.